Good morning, everyone. My name is Diane Blake, and I am the founder and board chair of Museum of Toronto. And I'm thrilled to see so many people here uh, on this very balmy November morning. Uh, Museum Connects, this is our first event, and that's what it's all about, networking, connecting, trying to bring the people in the city together, which is what Museum ultimately wants to do. Uh, first of all, I want to acknowledge that we are on the territorial land of the Mississaugas of the New Credit. And I would also like to thank Gail Lord and Veronica Blandon of Lord Cultural Resources for all their help in arranging this event with us. Uh, and also, of course, Roberto and his team at Grano for the wonderful breakfast and making everything um, so delightful. <laughs> <laughs> So for those of you who don't know, uh, Museum of Toronto is a new way to look at my, um, a Museum of Toronto history. Um, the project has been on the books, you probably know, for 40 years and we're trying to revitalize it with a different 21st century look at museums. It's a museum without walls, it's a new way to join together and celebrate the natural spaces, the archaeology, and the history of the city. Uh, so we want everyone to, um, to think in terms of the new, um, the new way to look at museums, which Gail is going to explain. Um, I'd like to also thank um, my fellow board member here, Maureen Marshall. Uh, she's our programming um, uh, board member. Uh, we have a very small board at the moment and we're all working very hard to try and get uh, Museum off the ground. So this is a great start for the um, cultural community. Uh, I'm now going to pass the mic over, you'll be pleased to hear, to Karen who's already spoken. She's our Executive Director and to Gail Lord of Lord Cultural Resources. Um, they're, they're going to talk about soft power which is basically what Museum's trying to do. So thank you again for all coming. It's great to see so many people here and I hope you have a productive and enjoyable morning. Thank you, Diane. I'm just going to make sure a few people get in and uh, take their seats. You all know Gail Lord. That's actually why you're here at 8.30 in the morning. It's Gail Lord. It's not my Zoom. It's not city builders. You are here because you're interested in hearing what our own homegrown talent that you know travels the world and can reflect really positive things about our city internationally and also share some of those best practices back at home with us. So we're going to begin. Um, I'm going to let, so there's someone else that's coming, but we'll let him sneak by. Uh, we'll begin by just having Gail come forward and talk a bit. If you um, don't already know, her most recent book, Soft Power, is out and about. And we think Myzeum might be a really interesting exercise in soft power. We didn't plan it. We didn't meet and talk. And she didn't say, we're going to launch this book. And then you guys are going to start this museum without walls. Um, but that's how it kind of worked out. Gail Lord. Welcome. OK, so we're going to, um, I'm just going to talk about, so there's two reasons why I think Myzeum is, is, is is a very brilliant notion. One is the reason that it, it has a new vision of what a city museum can be. And that's very important, and you're all here to build that vision. So that's key, and that's, I think, Diane and Karen's philosophy. But the other is we have entered, the big change is since 2008, we have entered a, a new world. Why am I holding this? I don't, do I need it? Yes, I need it, right? I do. Okay, it's fine. Gives, it gives me something to do, it's fine. Yeah, the mic's on your body is for the camera. This oh, the, uh, yeah, okay, fine. okay, well that, that's good because this is a museum that explains things to people, you see, that's very good. Okay, good. So, so the other reason is that now we've entered a world as of 2008, which is dominated by the city. And so I think you all know the simple statistic that as of 2008, more than 50% of the world's people live in cities. And that's a change to what we're like as human beings in, uh, in the world. And I think it changes the nature of the city museum too. So what I'm gonna start with, uh, oh, what is Lord? I think a lot of you will know we're, we're uh, Toronto-based. 
Global Cultural Planning Museum Planning Company. And uh, these are our offices. They're, they're all over Beijing, New York, Paris, Mumbai. And, and so we, 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 believe in, we believe in people's culture and, and in the world. And, and uh, we're really very based in Toronto. Uh, what is culture is the next slide. And I think it's just important to remind ourselves that culture is everything and everywhere. It's a human process um, whereby all human beings participate by transforming nature and society, producing meaning. So basically, culture is a meaning production process. Um, and I think what's interesting uh, is that cultural change, of course, is part of culture. Then culture doesn't stay the same changes every minute by minute by minute, second by second, and it, it changes why. It's not because of fashion, some people may think so, but because we are always interacting, we're always producing more, more meaning, and um, however, cultural change. I often think when people say, oh, you know, the world is so different because of technology, I often think of Jane Austen, um, one of my favorite authors, understandably. You know, she received a post five times a day if you look at the number of letters that Voltaire wrote, like it was like 20,000, some incredible number, and they've been collected. So it's not that people didn't communicate and communicate rapidly before, but certainly the technology of the internet has changed the intensity and rapidity of change. And cities are at the epicenter of change, the epicenter of cultural change. And that's because, um, well, cities concentrate people, and we together as people, we make cultural change. So to get an idea of the growth of cities, now Canada has been actually been, been an urban place, and so the United States and Western Europe for a long, long time. You know, we're about 80 to 90 percent urban. But the vast majority of the world actually isn't. And one way that we need to think about migration, immigration, the refugees that we're going to be welcoming to Toronto, many of them are not from cities because in the developing world, they are less than 50% urban. That's a, a cultural difference that we should be aware of. But the big thing is, oh yeah, I can't look behind me, but I, I trust you're gonna keep up with me. All right, good, because I have to talk fast. Is that, um, is that cities are now the very heart of economic growth. So that in fact, it's, it's quite <laughs> remarkable, something like 80% of the world's GDP is produced in cities. A very, very, very surprising. Um, a surprising change. Used to be that wealth was produced where the raw materials were, but now wealth is produced where the intellectual materials are, and that is in cities. And that's because there are, in cities are places like Grano, which is where cultural change happens, where people get together, people meet, people talk. So let's talk a little bit about Toronto as a city. Um, you know in 2015 is a very special year for Toronto because that's the year that The Economist magazine and uh, The Economist intelligence unit said that Toronto is the number one best city in the world in which to live. And I don't know if people at the back can see our competitor cities. It's totally incredible. It's totally fantastic. And, and of course, the, in true Toronto fashion, we really haven't made a lot of this statistic. If you think about it, why weren't there posters up all over the city and ads in the buses and car cards and stuff? Because, well, because that's how we are. We're modest, we're modest people. So here is a statistic that we can be really modest about, which is that we rank number 13 as, as a cultural experience. Now, number 13 is a kind of a contrast with number one. It's not so bad to be number 13, but if you take a look at the other cities, there's New York, there's London, there's Paris, there's Tokyo. I would think that, and there's Chicago, number seven, our true comparator city. We did the cultural plan for Chicago, I, I know very well. Um, but I mean, I think that we should have been able to make number seven or number six. And I, I do think that this number 13 that we're at speaks to a few issues that we have, and I think that they're issues that Myzeum wants to address. So the point is, you're part of how we get to a more prominent, integrated cultural positioning. It's not today, I think you're going to be talking at your tables about how this project can make that change. So museums have a very important role in city building, um, and there are seven here. Yeah, I, 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 I guess we try and make it big, but um, I'm just going to quickly run through them. One, of course, is preservation, uh, creation of new knowledge. We also are a tourism destination. That's a particular challenge for Toronto for reasons that you all know. Museums are civil society spaces. This is like one of the greatest civil society spaces in Toronto because why? Roberto at Grano brings people together. 
and, um, but museums also can bring, bring people together. Uh, they're economic generators. Uh, they present enlightenment and soft power. And then they really impact property values. Uh, my favorite example of that is, oh yeah, I don't know if you can see this. You, it's really worth it. Right across the street from the ROM, there is a condo going up. Big surprise, right? And, and, but on this condo, there's a sign that says, exclusive um, penthouses, eternal views. You know, the thing is, by being a museum, you are always presenting uh, beautiful space, manicured space, well cared for space for all the neighbors. So even for people who don't go into that museum, that you're having an impact on their quality of life, very important, but for the developers, you're having an impact on the value of that property, a value that they may not get right away, but a value that they can cash in on uh, in 40 years, in 50 years. And, and I think that the dispersed idea of museum is something that you want to think about. How does that, and how can the property, maybe in your tables you talk about, how do we get the developer industry in Toronto, which is surely one of the most successful in the entire world, to help pay for culture. So that's one of my things that I talk about quite a bit. So uh, this is a quote from Richard Florida, who wrote the introduction to our book, that points out that museums and cities are starting to work together uh, to exercise soft power. And the, the next is, what's the definition of soft power? And of course, it's in the book if you want to really get into it. And soft power, I think it's pretty obvious. It's the, it's the ability to change people's behavior through influence, agenda setting, discussion, conversation. Used to be, you know, uh, most of the literature on soft power is about diplomacy, which has to do with national governments. But what we're saying in this book, my co-author, Nairi Blankenberg, who's also from Toronto, but for some reason she lives in Barcelona, I can't imagine why, um, and right now. And she would love to be here today if she knew our weather was almost as good as Barcelona's, but I'm you're going to tell her, um, is that we're saying that cities are now exercising soft power. And there's, there's a saying out there, which is that, is that countries build walls and cities build bridges. And that's, so cities are getting together all around climate change, around refugee issues, although our new government, I think, is doing actually rather well on that subject, and both subjects, actually. Um, but cities act in many ways. Uh, uh, independently of, of, of national governments. So the next is about, and I'm just a little concerned, I'm like, okay, I, I can talk very fast, I hope, just bear with me, um, that a little bit about the knowledge economy. Toronto is a real leader in the knowledge economy, we're a powerhouse in the knowledge economy. If you go back uh, maybe 50 years, maybe 10% of the people who lived in Toronto were involved in the sort of what we would call the knowledge industries that, that you know, you have to think it's not just museums, it's not just culture. Knowledge industries include hospital, hospital research, R&D, engineering. Of course, the most creative economy of all is probably on Bay Street because they make up all these terrible new products. It's <laughs> certainly very creative. Uh, arts, music, culture, design, media. And in a city like Toronto is really in the top when you look at the data, and that's a very good indicator for my for museum, and a very good reason why it needs to be spread out, because um, the top cities in in terms of knowledge workers are Singapore, Amsterdam, and Toronto. We actually have a higher proportion of knowledge workers in Toronto than they have in New York. And by the way, one of the reasons for that is our our, our <coughs> traditional and fairly enlightened uh, immigration policies. But that that's another talk that I might be happy to give. So what are the demands of the knowledge economy and how does it change the way we behave and the way we think? And this is, I love these lists, you know, in the past and today, I don't know, they kind of help um, figure out cultural change and keep up with cultural change. In the past, a worker, physical strength, my husband's from Hamilton, right? So physical strength, you work in a steel mill, you, you, you know, or you're maybe working in coal, you're working in, but today it's, it's all about intellectual strength. Uh, in the past, following orders, Today, every worker is required to be, in some respect, a leader. Um, in the past, labor was organized for you. Today and in the future, it's very individualistic. And you have to organize yourself. You have to organize your own work. That's very hard for some people. Some problem solving today, all problem solving all the time. Of course, that's easy because knowledge workers create a lot of problems. And so therefore, <laughs> we can spend time solving them. That, that's good. 
The idea that in the past memorization was a key skill and today improvisation is a key skill. Probably when we want to remember a poem, if you're trying to do that, you wish you were trained a little better in, the, in, in memorization. Like in Flanders Fields, we'd all like to remember it, but you know, it takes more practice because we've been taught maybe too much creativity. However, that's a side issue. Basic communication in the past, excellent communication. Anybody here who's tried to hire people know you're looking for a great communicator. Observation, observe, right? That's the past way. Now participation. And then centralized organization and today networks. So again, I think this is the brilliance of my museum, Diane, just to pay some tribute to your sitting here, is that all the past attempts at doing a Museum of Toronto were based certainly <laughs> On, on, the centralized, on the centralized model. And you are based on a 21st century networked model. So I'm going to go very fast to say that cities have a lot of challenges. Poverty is one. I think we're all very proud of the fact that Toronto, like a lot of other cities in Canada, passed an anti-poverty uh, strategy just the other day. Uh, the, another, of course, with refugees, settlement of refugees, integration of refugees. These are all the, the, the big issues if you just kind of flip through them quickly, that, that cities are facing. And the challenge uh, that, that I'd like to pose to you and that, that Karen is going to pick up is in this era of soft power, museums and cities, what is the role of museums in working with cities on the many issues that cities face today? And so with that, Karen, I'm going to pass it over to you. Thank you, Karen. You know, you've got to stay with me. Come on. I'm going to hang out. So um, we're being really good and sticking to our timeline. I'm going to talk a bit about Myzeum. I don't have any pretty pictures. They wouldn't let me. Um, that um, as an exercise in soft power, and as I mentioned, uh, kind of jokingly, this was an accident when Diane and the founding board members were going through the process of hiring. One of the conversations we had was, because I knew about the past attempts and the focus on a building, and I thought that part of the reason there had been the failures was that the building was the paramount reason, not the discussion and the people and the conversations and the programming and the experience. And if you live in this city, you know that part of the great things about Toronto is just getting out in the city, being in the neighborhoods. This is one of the cities that I don't want to leave in the summer because of the various summer festivals. Pretty much from April right through until Nuit Blanche in the fall, there's things you can be out and doing every weekend. And, you know, as a black woman, I also drag myself out during Black History Month, even though it is the coldest month ever. <laughs> we have to do something about that. I haven't figured out a way to change it, but I'm working on it. I think we're going to do Juneteenth. Climate change. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 not climate change. Um, as we sit here on a mild November day. So what, what happened for us is, and I'll just kind of walk you through a bit of our process to date because it has been and is an experiment and I think we're finding overall the response of the culture community is telling us that we're making the right steps and hitting the right markers which hopefully will lead to success as we go further into engaging with the broader public. And many of you have been on the receiving end of this first step which was just to introduce ourselves as a new kid on the block. We've met with over 100 organizations, some small um, organizations that are literally mom and pop shops that passionate individuals for particular cultural communities are keepers of that community's story. They're collecting the narratives, they're collecting artifacts, and they're trying to ensure that there is some documentation for that community's place within Toronto and broader Canadian uh, narrative. And then the machines, the big entities like the ROM and the AGO, the Gardner Museum, and such that are iconic uh, structures and buildings that have a place in our consciousness and memory as kids going there to visit them you know, during school trips to adults it being the place you go to see um, international exhibitions. And in those conversations, what's happened is we found that both of those entities are interested in finding out about each other, which was part of what led to Connects. And I also have to tell the truth and say that wasn't our idea. Diane and I recall having a meeting with Gail, and she was like, it wasn't my idea. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was. That's why you're here, Gail. That's why you're here. 
<laughs> that's good. Because we're good consultants. There you go. There you go. But this wasn't even a consulting moment. You were just giving back to the T dot. You're giving back to the community, and we love you for it. Um, and when we told her about all these meetings, she said, "Well, that's a good thing. You should actually get people together because." Um, our public programs director, Britt Walter Nolan, comes from the arts. A lot of you may know her from the time she spent programming at uh, the Gladstone Hotel, and she's also worked at the Raman AGO. So we had a conversation about how the archivists, and I think we were at the Jewish uh, archive, and they said, you know, archivists don't meet at openings. We don't get together for wine and talk about artifacts. Whereas in the arts community, you are at openings, like you, you, you have the reason to network. And so we thought, okay, so let's create this opportunity. And the interesting hybrid for us is that the narrative around Toronto shouldn't be exclusively heritage, museum, artifact, or arts, community, culture. You really need all of those pieces together to properly represent this city in the 21st century. So this exercise, is kind of a fact finding out of our inquiry on what does the sector need and what place should we play in it. So for us, our soft power was about being curious, asking the questions and being respectful and introducing ourselves as someone new in the sector and finding out you know, what's already happening. We may have ideas, I have all kinds of ideas, I fall asleep with ideas about what I'd love for this to be as a Torontonian. But I also know that I don't know everything and I think the board recognizes that part of this is that uh, volley, the conversation of what you throw out and what comes back. And good museums should be all about interesting conversations. What is it, one of our board members, Bev was here, he would say, um, safe space for dangerous conversations, Karen. That's what we should do, create safe oh, space nice. for dangerous conversations. The next thing that we started to investigate was having a sense of the landscape of where the stuff is, where the narratives are, and where the uh, collection might be if we ever did get to a place where we might have a building or buildings. Because this exercise of thinking about Toronto's characters and the four quadrants that make up the city has led us to thinking, if we ever did get to a space, why would it have to be one? Why not various community hubs that might allow you to program and not have the downtown be the only place and not have the suburban communities feel like they all have to come downtown, but to really create an energy that allows us all to better investigate and know the city. Um, and that has led to Myzeum Intersections, um, which was a call out to the culture community and heritage community to play together. Um, Britt probably says this better than I do, but intersections meaning where two things or places or people meet and change each other. And so we're looking forward to seeing how that um, uh, culminates in a festival in March. March, as you all know, because you're good heritage wonks, Toronto's birthday, Museum Month. Okay. And what was the other week? There's another week. There's something else that happens in March. Oh, March break. <laughs> I'm the hip aunt that the children are sent to, so that's why March break is not front of mind. Although I end up with nieces and nephews during March break. Um, and then the last piece I want to quickly mention, because I know they're about to cut me off, is we um, uh, had, this, uh, had, this, had this event over the last six months called Myzeum on the Move, which was literally doing a public call out to people on particular themes. The danger, which I'm sure you're all aware of with the Museum of Toronto, is that every cultural group will want you to have a room or a moment for their particular story. And that being avoiding that landmine is one of the reasons we get up in the morning. So thematically, we would do something like at the CLGA, we had a um, Myzeum on the Move about protest, which is totally relevant to the LGBT community, but is also relevant to a bunch of other cultural communities. Mm -hmm. uh, so those type of moments has also allowed us to fact find, to canvas the sector to know what's out there. So when we get to big exhibitions, pop-up moments, we actually will be able to not just have it be narrative-based, but also borrow items that we can give back. Gotta give it back. Okay, I'm gonna end it there. <laughs> <laughs>